I'm blessed and privileged to be with you this afternoon. And a little over a week ago, Deborah Hetz contacted me and said, our, our presenter, the title, the workshop, the topic, and everything was done, uh, is not able to do it. However, some of my staff said, well, call Blaine. And get, and get, he does this kind of thing. <laughs> and so the, the little bit of a, uh, the new arena of transforming fatigue into fulfillment is a lot of the work that we, empowering work for both caregivers and patients. And, <clears throat> pardon me, and so it didn't quite synchronize with the formal title, but the topic will, the, the content of it will. Um, and in your folder is some information about myself, and we've been uh, privileged to live in the Western Slope for the last 12 years, the longest we've lived as adults anywhere because of moving with my career. And so when we came over in 2005, uh, my wife Tracy is a wild horse specialist and she hooked up with other people in the area to study the behavior of horses and we together then founded Steadfast Steeds. It's a Mustang horse sanctuary located on Glade Park and so we just, um, I get to take a scenic tour home uh, in the evenings after work and I work in town during the day. Our business, uh, as crazy it might seem, Steadfast Steeds, a Mustang horse sanctuary, has contracts with um, Hilltop and Larchwood and, and advocate for private clients uh, all across the valley as well and some coaching clients across the nation. We're grateful to be a significant national voice in the arena of caregiving empowerment through the wild horse work, through horses helping humans. And most of us, raise your hand if you've heard of equine therapy, helping special needs of whatever stage and age they are in life. Our specialty is equine coaching. So it's um, functioning, ambulatory functioning folks with their senior loved ones who might have dementia or cancer, um, going through transitions in life where, quite honestly, you don't feel like you have much of a voice and a choice for your daily schedule. It's appointments, it's medical, it's all those kind of things, taking time. And so it's hard to feel like you're living life anymore. You're just kind of a slave to the calendar. Doing, uh, just doing. Say doing, just doing. doing. Everybody feel like you're just doing a lot of doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, combining the work with horses, and Tracy will share more a little bit about what that means exactly. We've utilized some of the key principles that we learn from wild horses that do not have human intervention. So they're living on their own in family bands in the wild. How do they adjust and adapt to the very harsh climate changes and through the year? Those principles then help us to adapt and adjust and shorten the time of recovery from when we just get knocked back by whatever that might be to where our gas tank is up a little, well, at least turning off the gas light in our own lives. And uh, Wendy was sharing it at, at a different time than when she was on stage today about how at one point Delaney uh, had a crash uh, along her um, uh, treatments. And Wendy said, I was already at the burnout stage and I had nothing left to give her and boy she said that was a wake up call for me. I don't have, I, I can't be there for my daughter the way she needs me to be because I've let myself go too long and, and too deep. And so trying to prevent that also though when we start to feel ourselves going toward that trying to recover back to where we're, we're on our own game and, and living life on our terms. So again I'm glad to be with you this afternoon and we'll give you some new information and a handout and then we'll stick around for a few minutes after questions as well. The, um, I'm going to invite Trace to help us through this initial part so we can be fully present for this. I, I, I brought up the do piece because I heard Wendy say a lot of times, I do, I do, I do. And sometimes, oftentimes, that's how we get burned out. Doing, doing, doing. Didn't, weren't we created to be human beings? Mm -hmm. And so, what we've learned from the horse that helps us be human beings is to be present and in the moment. The horses only know being right here, right now. They don't, their head's not swimming with all the appointments in the future or lamenting about all the things that have already happened and how could we have changed to prevent this. They are in this moment, right here, right now. So we do an exercise to help our clients and to help anyone who wants to be more present. Um, it's just a couple of minutes. It's, we call it Take Five. And so I'm going to invite you to be really present in this room and feel what it feels like to be just in this moment. I want to invite you to either, you can close your eyes if you want to, um, or you can keep them open because this is an exercise that you can use along the way. 
grazing as you go and finding those peaceful moments in between all of the hectic moments. And the first thing that I will invite you to do is feel your feet on the ground. So if your legs are crossed, you might want to feel both feet on the ground. The, the earth has power. It is revolving and it keeps us stuck to the earth. And if we get too out of our bodies with too many things, or we get too grounded, we're too pulled in. So there's a balance between being grounded and being aligned. So feel your feet on the ground. As you feel your feet on the ground and you feel your body and the chair and the things around you, where does your awareness go in your body? Notice where the awareness is. You have a little tingle right here in your gut. Is there some tension in your shoulder? Is there, what is there, where is that? And what is it? feel like? What's the sensation? Tingling, hot, cold, poking, demanding, light, whatever that sensation is. It's, it's one that has a message for you in your body and it's, and it's sharing something that it wants you to know. And as we notice the sensations, what are my thoughts? Am I thinking about something else, or am I thinking about what that sensation might be trying to, to let me know? And then at the end, breathe into that space. Notice with the oxygen that bring, comes into your body and direct the oxygen to that space. Whatever that space is, whatever the message is, whatever the end sensation is, and let it expand that you can be really present in this moment. Telling that space, I know you're there, I understand, and right now I'm just going to be. And as you are able and willing, come back into the awareness of the room, very present and very in this space. One of the misinformation that's out there is that people who are on the journey of cancer, or where, where they are dealing with it in, within themselves, uh, are cared for by the others. The, that's not the myth. The myth is that cancer patients aren't caring for others at the same time they're trying to care for themselves. They are. Um, we're blessed to be with Todd on his journey uh, through the, the sudden collapse and the drastic diagnosis and the fear and, and all of that. And uh, I can tell you that he was caring for his parents, <laughs> his spouse, his friends, uh, those of us in the congregation. Uh, he was comforting to us even while he was going through his own stuff. Um, Tilly and Pat, uh, boy, with, with their son Barry and the beloved journey they're on, um, and can't forget the dog either, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> and uh, walking with him through that journey have taught me so much about what it means to care for and be cared for. And that also includes, as Wendy was saying, caring for ourselves, not in a judgment way, where you should you know, drink more water or get more rest. Okay, easier said than done when your whole life has been turned upside down and inside out. And therefore, our choice is to, as we join, as I join with these long-term friends and uh, with others on the journey through Hilltop and Larchwood and, and other families in the valley, the journey is about living fully as we go and shortening the time of recovery so that our, our daily highest quality of living is possible. After all, we're not cancer beings having an occasional human experience. <laughs> we're human beings having an occasional cancer experience. And so it doesn't define who we are or whose we are. We're so much more than that. The symptoms that often present themselves for pro professional care providers as well as informal or family caregivers are a, a term that came up after 9-11 called compassion fatigue. It's not a disorder or a disease. It's a set of symptoms. And it's just kind of, you see where we are on different parts of it. And we might have quite a few or we might have only a couple. Again, there's no judgment. It's just kind of a, uh, get a, a bead on where we are in the midst of these kind of <coughs> symptoms. And some of them, we don't, we don't know we're experiencing it, but are ones who are close to us that say, oh yeah, that's <laughs> you're experiencing that one. And so it gives us kind of an idea. They don't go from uh, less serious to more serious. They are just a group of symptoms that it tends to be like a frog in hot, warm water and it's comfortable. 
and you have a roll and then hot water and then boiling water and you, you don't realize it. And so it's helpful to actually see some of the things that can kind of wear us down as we're on the long journey ourselves and with our loved ones as well. After all, whether or not we have an illness within our own bodies, we are on the journey with those who do. And so we take on each other's emotional needs, our concern for them and the care. And uh, nationally, a huge percent of us who have family members with an illness are doing uh, an enormous amount of hours, uh, actual tasks, hands-on tasks, driving, doctor's appointments, uh, housework, all those kind of things as well. So in addition to carrying the emotional journey with our loved ones, we're doing different physical things that we don't normally do. And so how to adjust and adapt to that. One of the ways is to shift from just treating symptoms in our body to listening to the messages in our body. Uh, Tracy will give us a, a little bit more indication as to the horse work, but the nice thing about it is this isn't clinical or uh, sociological, it's not legal or financial, and we weave some spiritual tones into it because I'm an ordained clergy, yet it's a relational spirituality. And we all, many of us know the difference between churchianity and Christianity, <laughs> or you know, doctrine and beliefs versus real life relational spirituality that is a, an empowering tool for us, and that's kind of where, where we come at it. And so, the, when I get stressed, I usually develop a knot behind my right shoulder blade, and I can feel that. While I might take some ibuprofen for that small symptom, I'm also aware now going, okay, wait, what's that knot trying to tell me? Is it the way I'm sitting in my chair? Is it the, the computer? Uh, is it that meeting tonight? Uh-oh, is that person in the meeting tonight? I'm dreading having to confront our situation, you know? I don't want to go to that appointment and that kind of thing. And so, oh, that's what it is. And then we're able to do that take five and breathe into that space and just kind of expand it so that it's not controlling us through the day, but now we're getting gaining awareness to get a handle on it through our day. I'll still go and take some ibuprofen, and now I know why and what that's about, and can prepare for my day accordingly. I'm gonna ask Tracy to share with us a little bit about what the heck horses have to do with uh, care and support and empowerment. Our body has three brains. Most of us <coughs> only use this one on top of our head. We have a head brain, we have a heart brain, and we have a horror brain. I think, I feel, I know. Anybody know the difference between I know and I think? Comes from, think comes from the brain, know comes from the gut. So imagine a horse that is about eight times bigger than we are and the size of their gut. The horse also has about, the functional brain of a horse is about the size of a walnut. So they very much rely on their body language and what they perceive through their gut for movement. The wild mare, the one that's the leader of the, the herd, when, when danger walks into the pasture, she stops what she's doing, she lifts her head, and she stops breathing. And everyone else in the group looks to her. They don't look at what she's looking at, they look to her. And she then says, with her body language, we're going this way, or she puts her head back down, she starts grazing it, and says, no danger, we're all good. Everybody trusts her. Not one sound, not one sound is made. It's all body language. So when we're talking about messages of the body and the way that the horse perceives and works and, and as a, um, a prey animal that relies on that sense of their body, they offer really incredible non-judgmental feedback to things that we do that we might be one way on the inside and a different way on the outside and the horse goes, oh, you're danger, and they go away. It's not a judgment, it just is. It's how the horse responds. The wild horse really responds well because they have heightened senses of awareness that our domestic horses have a little bit lower because they've been living in domestication. They don't have to rely on that stuff as much as the wild horse does. But when we are able to shift our thinking and our being and trusting all three of our brains, the horse responds. And then we can move the horse together because they want to be where it's safe. And when we find safety together, everybody feels safe. Everybody feel unsafe when you're, when you're having to live life day to day, always on the edge, always wondering about the next appointment or the next 
fear or the next conversation. And so the horse helps us stay present and in the moment, and we have a better trust of gut, not just the head, not just the head. Mm. While family bands, again, they address s stressful situations very quickly. They have to discern it or they die. The one that thinks about it too long is the one that gets caught by the mountain lion. If they all listen to the lead mare and they take off running when she does because they trust her and they believe in her, they move off in secret, meaning they don't step on each other, they don't run over each other, they work together. And as families, as support people, as helpers, we can learn from the wild horse and how to be together and not step on each other's toes and be actually very effective at what we do. So the horses have a huge role in helping us learn to go from surviving to thriving. And so we're going to share with you some very practical principles that you can put into use without having to have a horse in your living room. <laughs> that's, the, that's the catch. Therapy dogs are great because they can go into the rooms and situations. It's a little harder with a, a formerly wild Mustang. Uh, some of these thriving habits of wild horses that we've studied in the wild and learned from other experts who have studied them and, uh, and also on a daily basis. Uh, Steadfast Deeds, our horse sanctuary, has 22 uh, formerly wild Mustangs. It's somewhere in the stage from not being handled yet, we can't even touch them and, and crazy gentles and socializing them, to very gentle, tame, uh, mature horses that we use in our coaching work with the two ladies. Uh, individuals, families, uh, employee teams, we do seminars like that as well. And some of the principles then that we discover are how to save energy for true emergencies. We can tend to expend our energy in worry and stress, anxiousness. I call it the bowl of cooked spaghetti. All the strands of my day and the relationships and everything gets worn together and it's kind of overwhelming and, and you can't separate. Is that their stuff or my stuff? Are they hurting or scared? Or is that really me or is it both of us? And, and it takes energy to literally try to analyze that and, and figure all that out. And so saving energy for true emergencies we learn from the horse that, number one, is it a true emergency, or can I come down a couple of notches, therefore I can think better and process better and save energy. And number two, yes, it's a true emergency, is it my true emergency? Or is my loved one or friend going through it? Because the minute it's not in me, it's not my true emergency, we can come down a couple of notches and it increases our problem solving ability for our friends and loved ones, as well as uh, doesn't just blow our whole uh, adrenaline energy all in one moment and situation. So a few of the principles underneath saving energy for true emergencies are the way that horses do it. Now they don't necessarily do the balloon breath, or at least I don't think Tracy trained them. They don't have to. We have to adapt like that. Um, they're very quick when that lead mare stops breathing in that fight, flee, or freeze awareness. She stops breathing, the whole herd around stops breathing, and they listen. And they quickly decide, are we running towards safety? Or can we go back to grazing? Is it safe where we are? And so discerning, whose emergency is this? And then um, the four by four breathing is a different technique that uh, folks use it in different ways of mindfulness, uh, meditation. And that is filling up our lungs slowly as if you're filling a balloon and then releasing it. Others call it box breathing. They'll breathe in for three or four seconds, hold it, and then release it for three or four seconds, and then leave the lungs empty for three or four seconds. So it's kind of a box type of way of doing it. Either way, uh, what horses teach us is that oxygen and that blood flow is so critical. And when we are uptight and we don't know it for a while, all of a sudden we go, because <sighs> our, our breathing has become very shallow, as if we're in danger. And we've not, that means we haven't discerned whose emergency we're really in. And then the art of moving quickly without being in a hurry. Oh my goodness, that's, that's, I'm still learning that one. It's pretty advanced. When Tracy's off our, our ranch and I go to feed the horses and I'm in a hurry because I'm headed down into town to work with some folks, um, I will rush down to the barn and grab the hay and say, hi you guys, how you doing? And my voice is really calm and say, hey, how's everybody doing? I'm frantically trying to hurry. And the horses, my own horses, will move away from me. I am not saying and, and thinking and feeling the same thing are not congruent. And when we're not congruent, when we're telling our loved one, oh, it'll be okay, and inside we're freaking out because we really don't know, we're giving out that same energy to them. And although they're polite, we're not necessarily helping our loved ones. We're giving energy to them in a positive way. And so 
what we can do is be efficient and, and really it's, it's an awareness of be efficient and I can still run down and do everything physically with the horse at the same pace I was but I can say hey guys I'm in a hurry you know mom's not here today and, and I'm headed into work so I gotta throw you some hay and, and get out of here real quick but they do not move they do not go away from me because what I'm saying is honest with my thinking and my, and my body sensations and I move and they're like oh okay we get it but the minute a mountain lion is on the prowl, they're going, I'm not going to eat you, I'm not going to eat you. Those horses are out of there. However, we've also witnessed a mountain lion passing within 30 feet of a family van, younger and older horses all grazing there, and, and the lead mare looks up. Since the lion is not on the prowl, and they go back to eating, and the mountain lion just passes right, right near them, and there's no harm. So discerning what is a true emergency and whose emergency it is. Getting back to grazing, oh my goodness, easier said than done. Horses, though, are, are masterful at it because they are as brilliant in their bodies as we are in our brains. They can move from the fight, flee, or freeze kind of ad adrenaline back into grounded, present, centeredness, and eating within seconds. They can have a, a tip with one another, and then as soon as that tip, the topic of it is solved, they can be grazing or grooming one another in moments. So how do we let the adrenaline kind of, okay, I felt that need, my body reacted, thank you. I don't need that now, I'm safe. And let it release. So we're getting back to grazing in our, in our being. The employees that I work with like that because they said it's not a clinical term. You know, you're not telling us to change our diet. Uh, we can actually say, oh, I, I like grazing. Getting back to grazing is releasing what's not helpful for us in that moment or in that day. Is this adrenaline really serving me well? Is the stress serving me well? Or isn't it? And then releasing it. That focus of being in the here and now. And I also want to be clear, when we say being fully present in the moment or in the situation, we're not agreeing that we like this situation. As I visited uh, with a woman a couple of months ago uh, over one of the centers where she was receiving her cocktail, and laying there uh, doing it, she didn't want to be there. However, being present, being grounded, letting, letting that chair support her was conserving energy for her rather than being preoccupied with what she wishes she was doing but can't be and I'm stuck here. And all of that is working and it's, and it's expending necessary energy for her healing and recovery. So just to release that and say, all right, let's just be in this moment. As much as we don't like what's happening circumstantially in this moment, we can be present, and then we're open to receiving and giving energy together. Another habit is grazing as you go. So getting back to grazing is releasing the unnecessary uh, adrenaline. You, you've already passed that. We're done with that. Getting back to your full being. Grazing as you go is feeding yourself through the day and through the week. And it is a, I don't know about you, but I love going to Sam's Club at noon time. <laughs> I am a grazer food-wise. However, this is also metaphorical. Wild horses will only graze when they feel safe. As Tracy mentioned, it all revolves around, do I feel safe emotionally, uh, spiritually, mentally, physically? Am I in a safe space with whomever I'm with at the time? And grazing as, as they go means that a, a, a horse up on the book cliffs may cover 20 miles in a day. However, they also will graze up to 16 hours a day. When their ears, their eyes, and their nose are on the ground, they're unsafe. Some, somebody or something could come out of the meadow or out from behind the trees. So they will only be down and graze if they feel safe in that moment. And other family band members are watching out for them too. And you know what that's like for good people that you trust will be watching out for your best interests. And so therefore they can do a little bit of bite of grass and then they'll pick their head up and they'll walk as they're, as they're eating. So they're still going through their day, but they're grazing along the way, which means little things, like living up on Glade Park. My drive home, uh, when I first, when we first moved up there six, seven years ago, was really hard. Uh, I told our counselor that I felt like my life, my, my home was at the ranger shack, <laughs> somewhere in between town and, and home. And now, it's a scenic tour, and I love nature and equine photography. And so, on the way up, uh, the last couple of days have been bighorn sheep hanging out above Serpent's Trail. Uh, 
call me a tourist if you want to, but I'm stopping and I'm getting out, I'm taking pictures and, and it just is so fun and I couldn't wait to get home and, and put it on Facebook or tell my daughter about it. And so that was a little bit of grazing as I go. So what are the hobbies or interests? Uh, what are the little things that can wait for you, like reading a book or crossword puzzles, that when you're not doing it, it doesn't demand your attention, but it's something that you get to go to and for you and just because you want to or you feel like it. Was that? It's the oxygen mask. Oh yes, right. As Wendy said, it's not putting on, putting on the oxygen mask for you. So it's feeding yourself a little as you go. I'll say a little bit more and give you a handout on reclaiming positive feelings and scenes. And then the mindful and spiritual habits that fill your tank. A lot of studies around meditation. Uh, Christian meditation, often people are praying to God or, or being in relationship with a higher power. And a mindful meditation is that centering and breathing. Uh, some, some patients will be sending billions of white blood cells to their tumor or their illness uh, location and just flooding their body with those white blood cells. So mindfulness meditation has been shown to increase oxytocin, to lower blood pressure, to really help ground and center us. And it's that shift of expending energy and doing and going <coughs> to being and receiving and it's self-empowerment. We get to choose to do that, so we don't have to wait for a prescription or a doctor's orders <laughs> to be able to, to practice mindful meditation. And uh, the fourth one is activate and sustain a coherent heart rhythm. I don't even know the medical term for it. A, a nurse told me recently over at Hilltop, and I, I okay, I, I believe you. And, by activating a coherent heart rhythm, it is very much like being in the flow. Um, Todd, you run 10Ks and 5Ks, you have been a runner, mm -hmm. and you know what it's like when you get in that flow and that, that uh, some people call it the second wind. It's a premium balance between oxygen flow, blood flow, and your, your muscle output, and it's working in synchrony together so you get a lot more uh, bigger bang for your buck, if you will. Horses are masterful at this. The only time they are not living in a coherent heart rhythm, which is uh, restoring and saving energy, is when they are in fight, flee, or freeze. And that is minutes per day, not hours. And so they quickly get back to grazing and back into that coherent heart rhythm. Here's what this is about. It is, on a, on a heart monitor, when we feel stressed or worried, when we are preoccupied with an upcoming appointment or event, or worrying about or fretting about something that's already passed and we wish we could have done it differently. When we are not in the present and we're feeling somewhat stressed or anxious, on a heart monitor, regardless of your heart rate, and the heart rate is similar, but the heart rhythm between, between the, among the beats looks very different. Uh, heartmath.org is a great website that, that they've done this research and hooked up monitors with horses and humans. And one of the things that they discovered is that when we have an erratic heart rhythm like that on the top, it feels very much like driving your vehicle one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake at the same time. You know, working them like that. It gets terrible gas mileage. It wears your vehicle out. It wears us out. That adrenaline might help us through that moment and with that situation. And yet, it's also exhausting our adrenals. And so the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are actually working against one another for that heightened sense of fight, flee, or freeze. But when we do that regularly, oh my goodness, it, it just fatigues us deeply. On the flip side of that, a coherent heart rhythm is more like a tennis player. You know, you've seen them on TV or maybe you've done it yourself. When they're getting ready to receive a serve, it's coming at them at over 100 miles an hour, you don't know where it's going. So there's ambiguity, there's uncertainty. I like us going into our day <laughs> and looking at what's coming up. However, when that individual is doing this, and, and the heart monitors will show, their heart rate is up because they're, they're getting ready to receive uh, a hard serve, but their pattern is, is coherent. And then they studied it with standing flat and trying to move to get a serve. And the heart rate was actually erratic because they were so nervous they weren't gonna get to the ball that it was actually detrimental for them. So moving, although they're, they're expending some energy, their blood oxygen, their mental being, their physical muscle output are all synchronized together for maximum flow. 
so they actually have a better chance of not only getting to the ball uh, physically, but they're also conserving energy even while they're in the middle of their tennis match. And so conserving energy as we go has a lot to do with how we can shift back into a coherent heart rhythm instead of just saying, okay, Blaine, get over it. You just let go of the adrenaline. Get back to your day. That feels judgmental and convincing myself to do it. When I can say, wait a minute, I'm going to take five, or I'm going to do a couple of these techniques we're about to hand out and give to you, then I get to choose, without regard to my circumstances or my relationships around me, to shift from an erratic, uh, energy-expending heart rhythm back into a restorative, a reviving, renewing heart rhythm as well, a coherent heart rhythm. So Tracy, would you want to pass those hand gloves out? And uh, I'll walk you through a, a couple of the steps that's on that sheet. the copies up here so if you would like to give one to someone else just grab one at, at the end of our time together too and take them and utilize them Non-judgmental feedback is really helpful. We have a hard enough go of it. We don't need to feel like we need to test somebody's posture or uh, are going to feel judged by them. That's our energy that is being expended unnecessarily. And so this feedback doesn't say should or why aren't you doing it that way. It's more of practical steps that have um, the scientists at HeartMath have shown can shift our heart rhythm from erratic immediately back into coherent. When we do that a couple of times a day or we're mindful of that, that's just like getting back to grazing. It's just, oh, okay, I'm shifting from blowing myself out to being able to collect myself again. With uh, CNAs and, and nurses and uh, nutritionists in some of our local organizations, this method is really helpful when they're about to walk into a patient or a resident <coughs> room. Uh, they may have history with that person, good or bad, but there's just a lot of stuff that goes with it. So they'll stand outside the room and they'll release their, their, what they anticipate or fear or are concerned about and reclaim, how do I want to feel? How do I want to be as I go into this person's room and support them and, and help them? And then when they come out, they can recover that as they go on to their next situation. And we do that fairly regularly. Uh, in fact, just last week, a client of mine was telling me that works with uh, families with children and hurting in our area and how exhausting that is. And she said, this is incredible because three nights this week, I have been able to sit with my girls on the floor and do coloring and crafts and things. And she said, I didn't have the energy to do that before, but now I'm saving energy to be able to do that. And I said, and what else have you learned? And she said, then it was blessing me that it felt so good to do that. I thought I was saving energy to give to them. And I was actually receiving more at the end of my day because we got that relationship time that didn't have to do with all the other things that stress us out. Releasing has to do with letting go of the, the feelings and the thoughts that are just aren't very helpful for you right now. They might be helpful tools or survival tools that we've used in the past. However, it's okay to acknowledge that was useful for me then. However, in this situation or in this season of my life and relationships, I need to think or process or feel differently. The table then in the middle of that sheet by Linda Kahana, who's a, a horse expert and an author of several uh, leadership books utilizing the horse metaphors and illustrations like we are, put this table together because she said it's so easy for people to come up with a negative feeling. Oh my gosh, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And they're kind of our go-to space, which obviously isn't really the best for us at this season of our life. So on the left side of that column, are ways we want to feel. So I want to feel more powerful. I want to have more confidence or things like that. And then on the right side of the table is are some words that point to the left side, the feelings. And so if I want to feel uh, in inspired or one of those things there at the bottom of the page, 
Uh, awe and majesty are a couple of words that will come to me. All I have to do is go back and mind them, no one else's, just my, my own experience, and go, okay, when is the time that I experienced firsthand awe and majesty? <laughs> and I just pulled up, uh, we live in the open glade right near the general store, a great park so our clients can find us pretty easily. And on the back of the hill, which overlooks the uh, movie Under the Stars place, it's an unobstructed view of, of 360 degree skyline. And a couple of weeks ago, I went up there to take a picture with my phone because it was just, I was like, okay, God, now you're just showing off. I gotta get a snapshot of this. And the camera could only get so much of the sky. And so I put it on video and stood there and just literally did a 360, even over Grand Junction, it was the same glowing pink and phenomenal. You could see the house and the barn go by, but the sky was lit up like we were in a glow. And just remembering that and seeing it in my mind's eye, my whole, I, I felt it, I, um, shifted back into that inspired and, and majestic moment. So we get to do that because it's a first-hand experience that our body, our mind, our emotions have experienced before. And then having that, we get to carry through our day, or whenever you feel somebody sucking the life right out of you, <laughs> go back to that, whatever it is, and you can name them. Or you can choose different positive emotions along the way as well for different situations in order to reclaim how you want to feel. So it's not convincing ourselves if the circumstances were different or I just need to have a more positive attitude. This is the how-to steps of getting to that space in order to feel safe and conserve energy. Down near the bottom of that sheet are a couple of questions for, for our own awareness and process. What can I release to shorten the recovery time between fatigue and fulfillment? So it's kind of like that hiker taking the backpack off and going, I started out on this hike, especially in the, in the summertime in our local desert. I started out on this hike carrying a gallon of water in my backpack. But three miles into the hike, it is way more of a burden than it is helpful. Water in and of itself, absolutely necessary for life. However, the way I'm carrying it, absolutely exhausting you know, on, my, on my journey. And therefore, I'm gonna, it's not really helpful at this season of my hike, so I'm gonna take the, water the gallon of water out, replace it with a tablet, a purifying tablet, and carry an empty water bottle. So when I get to a stream, pop the tablet in my empty water bottle, fill it up, and now I have enough water for the moment, but I'm no longer just carrying it with me just in case later down the path I need it. So it's a, a sharper discernment of what can I release that might be good in and of itself. It's not necessarily bad. It's just not helpful right now in, on my life and uh, illness journey. And then, what can I reclaim? To shorten the recovery time. And how do I want to feel? How do I want to be? And usually for me, it, it manifests itself in posture. So I'm kind of just, okay, I'm just going along and doing this in my voice tone. and. Um, when I go to a place, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm gonna feel empowered and confident, whatever that might be. And I can feel myself just go, oh, well this doesn't feel empowered and confident. I'm incongruent be between my head and my heart, and my heart, actually. And so, kind of straighten it up and go, what, what does that mean to feel confident? When was a time that I felt really confident and was making a contribution or helpful, whatever that is for me? Oh yeah, I remember her. And then the smile comes and the joy comes, and, then, and I'm back in that space, and then we go forward. So very helpful as we go along to keep from getting exhausted over the weeks and months as well. Um, any questions from that sheet that you kind of wonder about and go, wait, what does this mean? Yes? I saw you guys have a, a website that you have this PowerPoint on your website. We don't. We can. Okay. So okay. Do. Yeah, I can you, upload it to our website. You bet. There's a tab called the Sanctuary. Give me 24 hours and I'll get it up there. Yeah. So yeah, on, the, on the steadfastdeeds.org website, which uh, the home page is the wild horse situation, that's our four legged work. And because 50,000 Mustangs are standing in holding facilities, it costs us taxpayers more than $48 million a year for their care. When they're roaming in the wild, they're they're not a cost to us taxpayers. 
So the sanctuary's vision is to help them, because wild horses have lost their family, their freedom, and their familiar way of life, like illness does to our lives a lot, um, we advocate for their humane holding and try to get them adopted. So we'll work with the BLM and with the Department of Corrections in Canyon City to get the horses out of holding and, and more into the hands of people that can help them. And so they help us with this work as a way of giving them more meaning and, and purpose in their lives as well. Um, on the tab then across the top, as Tracy mentioned, is The Sanctuary. And that's my work with a lot of senior loved ones and family mediation and family support who are going through transition that they didn't ask for or deserve. And they're trying to hold it together instead of fall apart. And so we'll utilize some of this non-judgmental support and work for whole family systems of different generations so that they can start going shoulder to shoulder together as a safety, like a herd, instead of hoof to hoof or butt to butt, kind of just turn it back and et cetera. My friend Peggy gave me, gave us permission to uh, share some of her story as uh, one of the families in the Grand Valley that have been with and supported for, through the years. She will tell a little bit about her mom and also her sister. What I will share with you is that the horse she's standing with is named Gunny or Sir Gunnison. Uh, he came to our sanctuary last fall out of a, it was a, a rescue situation. He was really hurting and dilapidated and uh, 27, 27 years old. So the invitation was, he was on the front range, the invitation was, could Steadfast Steve give him a soft place to land in the, in the autumn season of his life, in, in the last moments? And so we said, sure, as hard as that is. And we had him quarantined for a month because he might have picked up a lot of things from the feedlot in, in the front range. He'd only been out of quarantine for two weeks when Peggy came up to the sanctuary for a spa day for her own, as a caregiver for a mom, for a sister, she was coming to receive and fill up and, and, and be with the horses. Well, none of the horse work requires horse experience and it's non-riding. Because we, for some of us, me included, that tends to make our anxiety go through the roof. But we're on the ground and relating with them through uh, the coherent heart rhythm. And, and so um, she asked if she could work with that, that old horse standing over there and we said, Oh, we've never used them in our coaching program before. Tracy always says, we trust the horse. The horse knows how to do this. However, he's, you know, in our equine assisted living facility. <laughs> and, so, and so we just didn't, yeah, we didn't know. We didn't know much of his background other than some neglect that it, that it obviously happened. And she said, well, I had an older horse, and I want to work with him. And her mom, Ida Marie, is 90, 93 at the time, and uh, said, Okay, let's just see what wants to happen. That's an important philosophy. Let's see what wants to happen and let's go there. Oh my gosh, they had a phenomenal session as Tracy's an equine facilitated uh, guided coach and she guided them through the process of her own awareness and her own ahas and uh, how she felt afterwards. She came up a few weeks later and said, okay, where's Gunny? I, I need some time. And so they went to a coaching session again and then at Christmas time she brought him treats and a bucket and snacks and everything with her family and her granddaughter uh, to see the horse that's been coaching her through her life transition. Since this video then, her mom has passed away and her sister is still living with stage four cancer. So, uh, let me see. mother who has dementia and has had some health issues. You've been there to support our whole family. And then when my sister was also diagnosed with cancer, stage four cancer, we were feeling pretty down. And we just come and, and sat with us during some really difficult times and helped us to, to talk about what we're going through and understand this part of our life and what where we are and then as an added gift he has invited me to come up and make these wonderful horses that have such a special connection and this is my buddy Gunny who has helped me process a lot of things that I'm going through and not knowing 
what our next step is or whether we can handle certain parts of our life. He's helped me to really learn more about myself and, and how I feel and what I am capable of and give me any epic strength. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, one of the things then that biologically happens, so a person does not have to be aware of it. I work with a number of older persons with dementia or Alzheimer's, and, and they can do this as well as any of us. And that is, when a person is standing within eight feet of a horse for longer than 30 seconds, so from zero to 30, the, the hearts are synchronizing. Because a horse's heart is five times larger than the average human heart, our heart rhythm synchronizes with the horse's heart rhythm after 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. People can be nervous, they can be, you know, go, oh God, these animals are big or whatever. And if they're just standing, <laughs> right, if they're just standing near the horse, we know, and that's where we do most of our teaching because the oxytocin is flowing, the blood pressure comes down, and they say, oh, I guess I thought I'd be really scared and, and this isn't so bad. And then they can end up brushing on the horse, uh, lots of exercises we do, reflected grooming and others, to help people just kind of be, ah, oh, this, is, this is really cool, because we know biologically the horse is restoring our energy and providing all that good stuff in us so we can really focus on what we do want life to be about, how we do want to feel, and how we intend to go forward centered and present as we're serving our loved ones and helping our own lives as well. So we invite you to conversation, and uh, you'll get that slideshow up on the website, and then uh, look for other unconventional or less traditional ways to be able to support caregivers and patients alike. Thank you for your attention and trust being here.